London Bridge by Frederick Edward Weatherly From the World's Best Poetry Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin London Bridge Proud and lowly, beggar and lord, over the bridge they go. Rags and velvet, fetter and sword, poverty, pomp and woe. Laughing, weeping, hurrying ever, hour by hour they crowd along. While below the mighty river sings them all a mocking song. Hurry along, sorrow and song, all is vanity neath the sun. Velvet and rags, so the world wags until the river no more shall run. Dainty, painted, powdered and gay, rolleth my lady by. Rags and tatters over the way carries a heart as high. Flowers and dreams from country meadows, dust and din through city skies. Old men creeping with their shadows, children with their sunny eyes. Hurry along, sorrow and song, all is vanity neath the sun, Velvet and rags so the world wags, until the river no more shall run. Storm and sunshine, peace and strife, over the bridge they go, Floating on in the tide of life, whither no man shall know. Who will miss them there tomorrow, waste that drift to the shade or sun, Gone away with their songs and sorrow, only the river still flows on. Hurry along, sorrow and song, all is vanity neath the sun. Velvet and rags, so the world wags, until the river no more shall run. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Crowded Street by William Cullen Bryant From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Crowded Street Let me move slowly through the street, Filled with an ever-shifting train, Amid the sound of steps that beat The murmuring walks like autumn rain. How fast the flitting figures come, The mild, the fierce, the stony face, Some bright with thoughtless smiles, and some where secret tears have left their trace. They pass to toil, to strife, to rest, to halls in which the feast is spread, to chambers where the funeral guest in silence sits beside the dead. And some to happy homes repair, where children, pressing cheek to cheek, with mute caresses shall declare the tenderness they cannot speak. And some who walk in calmness here shall shudder as they reach the door where one who made their dwelling dear, its flower, its light, is seen no more. Youth, with pale cheek and slender frame and dreams of greatness in thine eye, goes thou to build an early name or early in the task to die. Keen son of trade, with eager brow, who is now fluttering in thy snare? Thy golden fortunes tower they now, or melt the glittering spires in air? Who of this crowd to-night shall tread the dance till daylight gleam again? Who sorrow over the untimely dead? Who writhe in throes of mortal pain? Some, famine-struck, shall think how long the cold dark hours how slow the light, and some who flaunt amid the throng shall hide in dens of shame to-night. Each where his tasks or pleasures call, they pass and heed each other not. There is who heeds, who holds them all in his large love and boundless thought. These struggling tides of life that seem in wayward aimless course to tend, are eddies of the mighty stream that rolls to its appointed end. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. L'Allegro by John Milton, 
from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by jason in panama l'allegro hence loathed melancholy of cerberus and blackest midnight born in stygian cave forlorn mongst horrid shapes and shrieks and sights unholy find out some uncouth cell where brooding darkness spreads his jealous wings and the night raven sings there under ebon shades and low-browed rocks as ragged as thy locks in dark cimmerian desert ever dwell but come thou goddess fair and free in heaven ye clept euphrosine and by men heart-easing mirth whom lovely venus at a birth with two sister graces more to ivy-crowned bacchus bore or whether as some sager sing the frolic wind that breathes the spring zephyr with aurora playing as he met her once a-maying there on beds of violet blue and fresh blown roses washed in dew filled her with thee a daughter fair so buxom blithe and debonair haste thee nymph and bring with thee jest and youthful jollity quips and cranks and wanton wiles nods and becks and wreathed smiles such as hang on hebe's cheek and love to live in dimple sleek sport that wrinkled care derides and laughter holding both his sides come and trip it as you go on the light fantastic toe and in thy right hand lead with thee the mountain nymph sweet liberty and if i give thee honour due mirth admit me of thy crew to live with her and live with thee in unreproved pleasures free to hear the lark begin his flight and singing startle the dull night from his watch-tower in the skies till the dappled dawn doth rise then to come in spite of sorrow and at my window bid good morrow through the sweet briar or the vine or the twisted eglantine while the cock with lively din scatters the rear of darkness thin and to the stack or the barn door stoutly struts his dames before oft listening how the hounds and horn cheerily rouse the slumbering morn from the side of some hoar hill through the high wood echoing shrill sometime walking not unseen by hedgerow elms on hillocks green right against the eastern gate where the great sun begins his state robed in flames and amber light the clouds in thousand liveries dight while the ploughman near at hand whistles o'er the furrowed land and the milkmaid singeth blithe and the mower wets his scythe and every shepherd tells his tale under the hawthorn in the dale straight mine eye hath caught new pleasures whilst the landscape round it measures russet lawns and fallows gray where the nibbling flocks do stray mountains on whose barren breast the labouring clouds do often rest meadows trim with daisies pied shallow brooks and rivers wide towers and battlements it sees bosomed high in tufted trees where perhaps some beauty lies the cynosure of neighbouring eyes hard by a cottage chimney smokes from betwixt two aged oaks where corydon and thyrsus met are at their savoury dinner set of herbs and other country messes which the neat-handed phyllis dresses and then in haste her bower she leaves with thestilis to bind the sheaves or if the earlier season lead to the tanned haycock in the mead sometimes with secure delight the upland hamlets will invite when the merry bells ring round and the jocund rebecks sound to many a youth and many a maid dancing in the chequered shade and young and old come forth to play on a sunshine holiday till the livelong daylight fail then to the spicy nut-brown ale with stories told of many a feat how fairy mab the junkets eat 
She was pinched and pulled, she said, And he by friar's lantern led, Tells how the drudging goblin sweat To earn his cream bowl duly set, When in one night, ere glimpse of morn, His shadowy flail had thrashed the corn That ten day laborers could not end. Then lies him down the lubber fiend, And stretched out all the chimney's length, Basks at the fire his hairy strength, And, crop full, out of doors he flings Ere the first cock his matin rings. Thus done the tales, to bed they creep, By whispering winds soon lulled asleep. Towered cities please us then, And the busy hum of men, Where throngs of knights and barons bold In weeds and peace high triumphs hold with store of ladies whose bright eyes rain influence and judge the prize of wit or arms while both contend to win her grace whom all commend there let hymen oft appear in saffron robe with taper clear and pomp and feast and revelry with mask and antique pageantry such sights as youthful poets dream on summer eves by haunted stream then to the well-trod stage and on if johnson's learned sock be on or sweet as shakespeare fancy's child warble his native wood notes wild and ever against eating cares lap me in soft lydian airs married to immortal verse such as the meeting soul may pierce in notes with many a winding bout of linked sweetness long drawn out with wanton heed and giddy cunning the melting voice through mazes running untwisting all the chains that tie the hidden soul of harmony that orpheus's self may heave his head from golden slumber on a bed of heaped elysian flowers and hear such strains as would have won the ear of pluto to have quite set free his half-regained eurydice these delights if thou canst give mirth with thee i mean to live milton end of poem this recording is in the public domain dining from lucille by robert earl of lytton owen meredith from the world's best poetry volume six Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Dining O hour of all hours, the most blessed upon earth, Blessed hour of our dinners, The land of his birth, The face of his first love, the bills that he owes, The twaddle of friends and the venom of foes, the sermon he heard when to church he last went, the money he borrowed, the money he spent. All of these things a man, I believe, may forget, and not be the worse for forgetting, but yet. Never, never, oh never, earth's luckiest sinner, hath unpunished forgotten the hour of his dinner. Indigestion, that conscience of every bad stomach, shall relentlessly gnaw and pursue him with some ache or some pain and trouble remorseless his best ease as the furies once troubled the sleep of orestes we may live without poetry music and art we may live without conscience and live without earth we may live without friends we may live without books but civilized men cannot live without cooks he may live without books, what is knowledge but grieving? He may live without hope, what is hope but deceiving? He may live without love, what is passion but pining? But where is the man that can live without dining? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Family Skeleton From Modern Love by George Meredith From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Family Skeleton From Modern Love At dinner she is hostess, 
I am host. When to the feast ever cheerfuller? She keeps a topic over intellectual deeps, in buoyancy afloat. They see no ghost. With sparkling surface eyes, we ply the ball. It is in truth a most contagious game. Hiding the skeleton shall be its name. Such play as this the devils might appall. But here's the greater wonder, in that we, enamoured of our acting and our wits, admire each other like true hypocrites. Warm lighted glances, love's ephemery, shoot gaily o'er the dishes and the wine. We wake in envy of our happy lot. Fast, sweet, and golden shows our marriage not. Dear guests, you now have seen love's corpse light shine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Epicure from the Greek of Anacreon, translation of Abraham Cowley. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. The Epicure Fill the bowl with rosy wine, Around our temples roses twine, And let us cheerfully a while, Like the wine and roses, smile. Crowned with roses, we contemn Gyges wealthy diadem. Today is ours, what do we fear? Today is ours, we have it here. Let's treat it kindly, that it may Wish at last with us to stay. Let's banish business, banish sorrow, To the gods belongs tomorrow. Underneath this myrtle shade, On flowery beds supinely laid, With odorous oils my head o'erflowing, And around it roses growing. What should I do but drink away The heat and troubles of the day? In this more than kingly state, Love himself shall on me wait. Fill to me, love, nay fill it up, And mingled cast it into the cup. Wit and mirth and noble fires, Vigorous health and gay desires, The wheel of life no less will stay In a smooth than rugged way. Since it equally doth flee, Let the motion pleasant be. Why do we precious ointments shower? Noble wines, why do we pour? Beauteous flowers, why do we spread Upon the monuments of the dead? Nothing they but dust can show, Or bones that hasten to be so. Crown me with roses while I live. Now your wines and ointments give. After death I nothing crave. Let me alive my pleasures have, All are stoics in the grave. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Indian Weed by Anonymous From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama The Indian Weed This Indian weed, now withered quite, Though green at noon, cut down at night, Shows thy decay, all flesh is hay, Thus think and drink tobacco. The pipe, so lily-like and weak, Does thus thy mortal state bespeak. Thou art e'en such, gone with a touch, Thus think and drink tobacco. And when the smoke ascends on high, Then thou behold'st the vanity Of worldly stuff, gone with a puff, Thus think and drink tobacco. And when the pipe grows foul within, Think on thy soul defiled with sin, For then the fire it does require, Thus think and drink tobacco. And cease the ashes cast away, Then to thyself thou mayest say, That to the dust return thou must, Thus think and drink tobacco. Anonymous, 17th Century End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Smoking Spiritualized by Ralph Erskine. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Smoking Spiritualized. Was this small plant for thee cut down? So was the plant of great renown which mercy sends for nobler ends. Thus think and smoke tobacco. Doth juice medicinal proceed from such a naughty foreign weed? Then what's the power of Jess's flower? Thus think and smoke tobacco. The promise, like the pipe in lays, and by the mouth the faith conveys, what virtue flows from Sharon's rose? Thus think and smoke tobacco. In vain the unlighted pipe you blow, your pains in outward means are so, till heavenly fire your heart inspire. Thus think and smoke tobacco. The smoke, like burning incense towers, so should a praying heart of yours, with ardent cries, surmount the skies. Thus think and smoke tobacco. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Without and Within by Pietro Metastasio Translated from Italian From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama Without and Within if every man's internal care were written on his brow, How many would our pity share who raise our envy now? The fatal secret when revealed of every aching breast Would prove that only while concealed their lot appeared the best. From the Italian of Metastasio End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Il Penzoroso by John Milton From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Il Penzoroso Hence, vain deluding joys, The brood of folly without father bred, How little you bestead, Or fill the fixed mind with all your toys. Dwell in some idle brain, and fancies fond with gaudy shapes possess, As thick and numberless as the gay motes that people the sunbeams, Or likest hovering dreams, the fickle pensioners of Morpheus's train. The hail, thou goddess, sage and holy, Hail, divinest melancholy, Whose saintly visage is too bright To hit the sense of human sight, And therefore, to our weaker view, or laid with black, stayed wisdom's hue. Black, but such as in esteem Prince Memnon's sister might beseem, or that starred Ethiop queen that strove to set her beauty's praise above the sea nymphs and their powers offended. Yet thou art higher, far descended. Thee bright haired Vesta, long of yore, to solitary Saturn bore. His daughter she, in Saturn's reign, such mixture was not held a stain. Oft in glimmering bowers and glades he met her, and in secret shades of woody Ida's inmost grove, while yet there was no fear of Jove. Come, pensive nun, devout and pure, sober, steadfast and demure, all in a robe of darkest grain, flowing with majestic train and sable stole of cypress lawn over thy decent shoulders drawn. Come but keep thy wonted state, with even step and musing gait, and looks commercing with the skies, thy rapt soul sitting in thine eyes. There held in holy passion still, forget thyself to marble, till with a sad, leaden, downward cast, thou fix them on the earth as fast and join with thee calm peace and quiet, spare fast, that oft with gods doth diet, and hears the muses in a ring, 
I round about Jove's altar sing, And add to these retired leisure That in trim gardens takes his pleasure. But first and chiefest, With thee bring him that yon soars on golden wing, Guiding the fiery wheeled throne, The cherub contemplation, And the mute silence hissed along, Lest Philomel will deign a song In her sweetest, saddest plight, Smoothing the rugged brow of night, While Cynthia checks her dragon yoke Gently o'er the accustomed oak. Sweet bird, that shunts the noise of folly, Most musical, most melancholy, Thee, chantress, oft, the woods among, I woo to hear thy even song. And, missing thee, I walk unseen On the dry, smooth-shaven green, to behold the wandering moon riding near her highest noon, Like one that had been led astray Through the heaven's wide pathless way. And oft, as if her head she bowed, Stooping through a fleecy cloud, Oft, on a plat of rising ground, I hear the far-off curfew sound Over some wide-watered shore, Swinging slow with sullen roar. Or if the air will not permit, some still removed place will fit, where glowing embers through the room teach light to counterfeit a gloom. Far from all resort of mirth, save the cricket on the hearth, or the bellman's drowsy charm to bless the doors from nightly harm. Or let my lamp at midnight hour be seen in some high lonely tower, where I may oft outwatch the bear with thrice great Hermes or in sphere the spirit of Plato, to unfold what worlds or what vast regions hold the immortal mind that hath forsook her mansion in this fleshly nook. And of those demons that are found in fire, air, flood, or underground, whose power hath a true consent with planet or with element. Sometime let gorgeous tragedy in sceptred Paul come sweeping by, Presenting Thebes or Pelops' line, Or the tale of Troy divine, Or what, though rare, of later age, Ennobled hath the buskined stage. But, O oh, sad virgin, That thy power might raise Musaeus from his bower, Or bid the soul of Orpheus sing Such notes as, warbled to the string, Drew iron tears down Pluto's cheek, and made hell grant what love did seek. Or call up him that left half told The story of Cambuscan bold, Of Campbell and of Algersaif, And who had canisade to wife, That owned the virtuous ring and glass, And of the wondrous horse of brass On which the Tartar king did ride. And, if aught else great bards beside, In sage and solemn tunes have sung, of tourneys and of trophies hung, Of forests and enchantments drear, Where more is meant than meets the ear. Thus, night, oft see me in thy pale career, Till civil-suited morn appear, Not tricked and frounced, as she was wont, With the attic boy to hunt, But kerchiefed in a comely cloud, While rocking winds are piping loud, or ushered with a shower still, When the gust hath blown his fill, Ending on the rustling leaves, With minute drops from off the eaves. And when the sun begins to fling His flaring beams, Me, goddess, bring to arched walks Of twilight groves, And shadows brown, That sylvan loves, Of pine or monumental oak, Where the rude axe with heavy stroke was never heard the nymphs to daunt, Or fright them from their hallowed haunt. There in close covert by some brook, Where no profaner eye may look, Hide me from day's garish eye, While the bee with honeyed thigh, That at her flowery work doth sing, And the waters murmuring, With such consort as they keep, Entice the dewy feathered sleep. And let some strange mysterious dream Wave at his wings, an airy stream Of lively portraiture displayed, Softly on my eyelids laid. And, as I wake, 
Sweet music breathe above, about, or underneath, Sent by some spirit to mortal's good, Or the unseen genius of the wood. But let my due feet never fail To walk the studious cloisters pale, And love the high embowed roof, With antique pillars massy proof, And storied windows, richly dight, Casting a dim religious light. There let the pealing organ blow To the full-voiced choir below, In service high and anthems clear, As may with sweetness, through mine ear, Dissolve me into ecstasies, And bring all heaven before mine eyes. And may at last my weary age Find out the peaceful hermitage, The hairy gown and mossy cell, Where I may sit and rightly spell Of every star that heaven doth shew and every herb that sips the dew, till old experience do attain to something like prophetic strain. These pleasures, melancholy, give, and I with thee will choose to live. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Excelsior by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator Thomas Peter as the youth Craig Franklin as the old man Lian Yao as the maiden And Jason in Panama as the peasant Excelsior The shades of night were falling fast as through an alpine village passed a youth who bore mid snow and ice a banner with the strange device excelsior his brow was sad his eye beneath flashed like a falchion from its sheath and like a silver clarion rung the accents of that unknown tongue excelsior in happy homes he saw the light of household fires gleam warm and bright above the spectral glaciers shone and from his lips escaped a groan excelsior try not the pass the old man said dark lowers the tempest overhead the roaring torrent is deep and wide and loud that clarion voice replied excelsior O oh, stay, the maiden said, and rest thy weary head upon this breast. A tear stood in his bright blue eye, but still he answered with a sigh. Excelsior! Beware the pine tree's withered branch, beware the awful avalanche. This was the peasant's last good night, a voice replied far up the height. Excelsior! At break of day, as heavenward, the pious monks of St. Bernard uttered the oft repeated prayer, a voice cried through the startled air Excelsior! A traveller by the faithful hound, half buried in the snow, was found, still grasping in his hand of ice that banner with the strange device excelsior there in the twilight cold and grey lifeless but beautiful he lay and from the sky serene and far a voice fell like a falling star excelsior end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Wild Ride by Louise Imogen Guinea From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama The Wild Ride I hear in my heart, I hear in its ominous pulses, All day, the commotion of sinewy, mane-tossing horses, All night, from their cells, the importunate tramping and neighing. Cowards and laggards fall back, but alert to the saddle. 
straight, grim, and abreast, vault our weather-torn galloping legion, with stirrup-cup each to the one gracious woman that loves him. The road is through dolor and dread, over crags and morasses. There are shapes, by the way, there are things that appall or entice us. What odds? We are knights, and our souls are but bent on the riding. Thought's self is a vanishing wing, and joy is a cobweb, and friendship a flower in the dust, and glory a sunbeam. Not here is our prize, nor, alas, after these our pursuing. A dipping of plumes, a tear, a shake of the bridle, a passing salute to this world and her pitiful beauty. We hurry with never a word in the track of our fathers. I hear in my heart, I hear in its ominous pulses, all day the commotion of sinewy mane-tossing horses, all night from their cells the importunate tramping and neighing. We spur to a land of no name, outracing the storm wind. We leap to the infinite dark like the sparks from the anvil. Thou leadest, O God, all's well with thy troopers that follow. Louise Imogen Guinea End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Vagabonds by John Townsend Trowbridge From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin The Vagabonds We are two travellers, Roger and I. Roger's my dog. Come here, ye scamp. Jump for the gentleman. Mind your eye over the table. Look out for the lamp. The rogue is growing a little old. Five years we've tramped through wind and weather, and slept outdoors when nights were cold, and ate and drank and starved together. We've learnt what comfort is, I tell you. A bed on the floor, a bit of rose in, a fire to thaw our thumbs. Poor fellow, the poor he holds up there's been frozen. Plenty of catgut for my fiddle. This outdoor business is bad for the strings. Then a few nice buckwheats hot from the griddle, and Roger and I set up for kings. No, thank ye, sir, I never drink. Roger and I are exceedingly moral. Aren't we, Roger? See him wink. Well, something hot, then. We won't quarrel. He's thirsty, too. See him nod his head. What a pity, sir, that dogs can't talk. He understands every word that's said, and he knows good milk from water and chalk. The truth is, sir, now I reflect, I've been so sadly given to grog, I wonder I've not lost the respect. Here's to you, sir, even of my dog. But he sticks by through thick and thin, and this old coat with its empty pockets and rags that smell of tobacco and gin, he'll follow while he has eyes in his sockets. There isn't another creature living, would do it and prove through every disaster, so fond, so faithful, and so forgiving to such a miserable, thankless master. No, sir, see him wag his tail and grin. By George, it makes my old eyes water. That is, there's something in this gin that chokes a fellow. But no matter. We'll have some music if you're willing. And Roger, <clears throat> what a plaque a cough is, sir. Shall march a little. Start, you villain. Stand straight, bout face, salute your officer. Put up that paw, dress, take your rifle. Some dogs have arms, you see. Now hold your cap while the gentlemen give a trifle to aid a poor old patriot soldier. March, halt, now show how the rebel shakes when he stands up to hear his sentence. Now tell us how many drams it takes to honour a jolly new acquaintance. Five yelps, that's five, he's mighty knowing. The night's before us, fill the glasses. Quick, sir, I'm ill, my brain is going. Some brandy, thank you. There, it passes. Why not reform? That's easily said. But I've gone through such wretched treatment. 
sometimes forgetting the taste of bread and scarce remembering what meat meant that my poor stomach's past reform and there are times when mad with thinking i'd sell out heaven for something warm to prop a horrible inward sinking is there a way to forget to think at your age sir home fortune friends a dear girl's love but i took to drink the same old story you know how it ends if you could have seen these classic features you needn't laugh sir they were not then such a burning libel on god's creatures i was one of your handsome men if you had seen her so fair and young whose head was happy on this breast if you could have heard the songs i sung when the wine went round you wouldn't have guessed that ever i sir should be straying from door to door with fiddle and dog ragged and penniless and playing to you to-night for a glass of grog she's married since a parson's wife twas better for her that we should part better the soberest prosiest life than a blasted home and a broken heart i have seen her once i was weak and spent on the dusty road a carriage stopped but little she dreamed as on she went who kissed the coin that her fingers dropped you set me talking sir i'm sorry it makes me wild to think of the change what do you care for a beggar's story is it amusing you find it strange i had a mother so proud of me twas well she died before do you know if the happy spirits in heaven can see the ruin and wretchedness here below another glass and strong to deaden this pain then roger and i will start i wonder has he such a lumpish leaden aching thing in place of a heart he is sad sometimes and would weep if he could no doubt remembering things that were a virtuous kennel with plenty of food and himself a sober respectable cur i'm better now that glass was warming you rascal limber your lazy feet we must be fiddling and performing for supper and bed or starve in the street not a very gay life to lead you think but soon we shall go where lodgings are free and the sleepers need neither victuals nor drink the sooner the better for roger and me end of poem this recording is in the public domain Fame by Alexander Pope from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Fame, from an Essay on Man, Epistle Four. What's fame? A fancied life in others' breath, a thing beyond us, even before our death. Just what you hear, you have, and what's unknown, the same, my lord if tully's or your own all that we feel of it begins and ends in the small circle of our foes or friends to all beside as much an empty shade a eugene living as a caesar dead alike or when or where they shone or shine or on the rubicon or on the rhine a wit's a feather and a chief a rod an honest man's the noblest work of god fame but from death a villain's name can save as justice tears his body from the grave when what to oblivion better were resigned is hung on high to poison half mankind all fame is foreign but of true desert plays round the head but comes not to the heart one self-approving hour whole years outweighs of stupid starers and of loud huzzas and more true joy marcellus exiled feels than caesar with a senate at his heels end of poem this recording is in the public domain pelters of pyramids by richard henry hengist horn from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Pelters of Pyramids 
A Shoal of Idlers, from a merchant craft anchored off Alexandria, went ashore, and mounting asses in their headlong glee, round Pompey's pillar rode with hoots and taunts, as men oft say, What art thou more than we? Next in a boat they floated up the Nile, singing and drinking, swearing senseless oaths, shouting and laughing most derisively at all majestic scenes. A bank they reached, and clambering up, played gambles among tombs, and in portentous ruins, through whose depths the mighty twilight of departed gods both sun and moon glanced furtive as an awe. They hid, and whooped, and spat on sacred things. At length, beneath the blazing sun, they lounge near a great pyramid. A while they stood, with stupid stare, until resentment grew in the recoil of meanness from the vast. And gathering stones, they with coarse oaths and jibes, as they would say, What are thou more than we? Pelted the pyramid. But soon these men, hot and exhausted, sat them down to drink, wrangled, smoked, spat, and laughed, and drowsily cursed the bald pyramid and fell asleep. Night came, a little sand went drifting by, and morn again was in the soft blue heavens. The broad slopes of the shining pyramid looked down in their austere simplicity upon the glistening silence of the sands, whereon no trace of mortal dust was seen. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Enid's Song by Alfred, Lord Tennyson From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Enid's Song From Idols of the King Turn, Fortune, turn thy wheel and lower the proud Turn thy wild wheel through sunshine, storm and cloud Thy wheel and thee we neither love nor hate. Turn, fortune, turn thy wheel with smile or frown. With that wild wheel we go not up or down. Our hoard is little, but our hearts are great. Smile and we smile, the lords of many lands. Frown and we smile, the lords of our own hands. For man is man, and master of his fate. Turn, Turn thy wheel above the staring crowd, Thy wheel and thou art shadows in the cloud. Thy wheel and thee we neither love nor hate. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fortune from Fanny by Fitzgreen Halleck from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. Fortune But Fortune, like some others of her sex, delights in tantalising and tormenting. One day we feed upon their smiles, the next is spent in swearing, sorrowing, and repenting. Eve never walked in paradise more pure, than on that morn when Satan played the devil with her and all her race. A lovesick wooer never asked a kinder maiden or more civil than Cleopatra was to Antony the day she left him on the Ionian Sea. The serpent, loveliest in his coiled ring, with eye that charms and beauty that outvies the tints of the rainbow, bears upon his sting the deadliest venom. Ere the dolphin dies, its hues are brightest. Like an infant's breath are tropic winds before the voice of death is heard upon the waters, summoning the midnight earthquake from its sleep of years to do its task of woe. The clouds that fling the lightning 
brighten ere the bolt appears. The pantings of the warrior's heart are proud upon that battle worn, whose night dews wet his shroud. The sun is loveliest as he sinks to rest. The leaves of autumn smile when fading fast. The swan's last song is sweetest. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Opportunity by William Blake From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Opportunity He who bends to himself a joy Does the winged life destroy But he who kisses the joy as it flies Lives in eternity's sunrise If you trap the moment before it is ripe the tears of repentance you'll certainly wipe. But if once you let the ripe moment go, you can never wipe off the tears of woe. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Opportunity by John James Ingalls From The World's Best Poetry Volume 6. Fancy and Sentiment. Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Ya. Opportunity. Master of human destinies am I. Fame, love, and fortune on my footsteps wait. Cities and fields I walk, I penetrate. Deserts and seas remote, and passing by, hovel and mart and palace, Soon or late, I knock unbidden, once at every gate. If sleeping, wake, if feasting, rise before I turn away. It is the hour of fate, and they who follow me reach every state mortals desire, and conquer every foe save death. But to those who doubt or hesitate, condemn to failure, penury, and woe, Seek me in vain and uselessly implore. I answer not, and I return no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Undeveloped Lives by William E. H. Leckie From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Undeveloped Lives Not every thought can find its words, Not all within is known, For minds and hearts have many chords That never yield their tone. Tastes, instincts, feelings, passions, powers Sleep there, unfelt, unseen, And other lives lie hid in ours, the lives that might have been. Affections whose transforming force could mould the heart anew, strong motives that might change the course of all we think and do. Upon the tall cliff's cloud-wrapped verge the lonely shepherd stands, and hears the thundering ocean surge that sweeps the far-off strands, and sings in peace of raging storms where he will never be, of life in all its unknown forms, in lands beyond the sea. So in our dreams some glimpse appears, though soon it fades again, how other lands or times or spheres might make us other men. How half our being lies in trance, nor joy nor sorrow brings, unless the hand of circumstance can touch the latent strings. We know not fully what we are, still less what we might be, but hear faint voices from the far, dim lands beyond the sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Augury by Edith M. Thomas from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, 
Fancy and Sentiment, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Augury. A horseshoe nailed for luck upon a mast. That mast wave bleached upon the shore was cast. I saw, and thence no fetish I revered, but safe through tempest to my haven steered. The place with rose and myrtle was o'ergrown, yet fear and sorrow held it for their own. A garden then I sowed without one fear, sowed fennel, yet lived griefless all the year. Brave lines, long life did my friend's hand display. Not so mine own, yet mine is quick today. Once more in his I read fate's idle jest, then fold it down forever on his breast. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Keep Sweet and Keep Moving by Robert J. Burdett From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Keep Sweet and Keep Moving Homely phrase of our Southland bright Keep steady step to the flam of the drum Touch to the left, eyes to the right Sing with the soul, though the lips be dumb. Hard to be good when the wind's in the east, Hard to be gay when the heart is down, When they that trouble you are increased, When you look for a smile and see a frown. But keep sweet and keep moving. Sorrow will shade the blue sky gray, Gray is the color our brothers wore. Sunshine will scatter the clouds away. Azure will gleam in the skies once more. Colors of patience and hope are they. Always at even in one they blend. Tinting the heavens by night and day. Over our hearts to the journey's end. Just keep sweet and keep moving. Hard to be sweet when the throng is dense. When elbows jostle and shoulders crowd, Easy to give and to take offense, When the touch is rough and the voice is loud. Keep to the right in the city's throng, Divide the road on the broad highway. There's one way right when everything's wrong, Easy and fair goes far in a day. Just keep sweet and keep moving. The quick taunt answers the hasty word. The lifetime chance for a help is missed. The muddiest pool is a fountain stirred. A kind hand clenched makes an ugly fist. When the nerves are tense and the mind is vexed, the spark lies close to the magazine. Whisper a hope to the soul perplexed. Banish the fear with a smile serene. Just... Keep sweet and keep moving. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Tear by Samuel Rogers From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter A Tear Oh, that the chemist's magic art Could crystallize the sacred treasure. Long should it glitter near my heart, A secret source of pensive pleasure. The little brilliant, ere it fell, Its luster caught from Chloe's eye, Then, trembling, left its coral cell, The spring of sensibility, Sweet drop of pure and pearly light, In thee the rays of virtue shine, More calmly clear, more mildly bright, Than any gem that gilds the mine. Benign restorer of the soul, Whoever flies to bring relief, When first we feel the rude control Of love or pity, 
joy, or grief. The sages and the poets theme, in every clime, in every age, thou charmst in fancy's idle dream, in reason's philosophic page. That very law which molds a tear, and bids it trickle from its source, that law preserves the earth a sphere, and guides the planets in their course. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Jester's Sermon by George Walter Thornbury From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator And Thomas Peter as the jester The Jester's Sermon the jester shook his hood and bells and leapt upon a chair. The pages laughed, the women screamed and tossed their scented hair. The falcon whistled, staghounds bayed, the lapdog barked without, the scullion dropped the pitcher brown, the cook railed at the lout. The steward, counting out his gold, let pouch and money fall, and why? Because the jester rose to say grace in the hall. The page played with the heron's plume, the steward with his chain. The butler drummed upon the board and laughed with might and main. The grooms beat on their metal cans and roared till they were red. But still the jester shut his eyes and rolled his witty head. And when they grew a little still, read half a yard of text, and waving hand struck on the desk, then frowned like one perplexed. Dear sinners all, the fool began, Man's life is but a jest, a dream, a shadow, bubble, air, a vapour at the best. In a thousand pounds of law I find not a single ounce of love. A blind man killed the parson's cow in shooting at the dove. The fool that eats till he is sick must fast till he is well. The wooer who can flatter most will bear away the bell. Let no man halloo he is safe till he is through the wood. He who will not when he may must tarry when he should. He who laughs at crooked men should need walk very straight. Oh, he who once has won a name may lie abed till eight. Make haste to purchase house and land, be very slow to wed. True coral needs no painter's brush, nor need be daubed with red. The friar, preaching, cursed the thief, the pudding in his sleeve. To fish for sprats with golden hooks is foolish, by your leave. To travel well, an ass's ears, hog's mouth, and ostrich legs. He does not care a pin for thieves who limps about and begs. Be always first man at a feast, and last man at a fray. The short way round, in spite of all, is still the longest way. When the hungry curate licks a knife, there's not much for the clerk. When the pilot, turning pale and sick, looks up, the storm grows dark. Then loud they laughed. The fat cook's tears ran down into the pan. The steward shook that he was forced to drop the brimming can. And then again the women screamed, and every staghound bayed. And why? Because the motley fool so wise a sermon made. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Fool's Prayer by Edward Rowland Sill From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama as the narrator Craig Franklin as the king And Sonia as the fool The Fool's Prayer The royal feast was done The king sought some new sport to banish care and to his jester cried, Sir fool, 
kneel now and make for us a prayer. The jester doffed his cap and bells, and stood the mocking court before. They could not see the bitter smile behind the painted grin he wore. He bowed his head and bent his knee upon the monarch's silken stool. His pleading voice arose. O oh Lord, be merciful to me, a fool. No pity, Lord, could change the heart from red with wrong to white as wool. The rod must heal the sin, but, Lord, be merciful to me, a fool. Tis not by guilt the onward sweep of truth and right, O Lord, we stay. Tis by our follies that so long we hold the earth from heaven away. These clumsy feet, still in the mire, go crushing blossoms without end. These hard, well-meaning hands we thrust among the heart-strings of a friend. The ill-timed truth we might have kept, who knows how sharp it pierced and stung, the word we had not sense to say, who knows how grandly it had rung. Our faults no tenderness should ask, the chastening stripes must cleanse them all, but for our blunders, oh, in shame, before the eyes of heaven we fall. Earth bears no balsam for mistakes. Man crowned the knave and scourged the tool that did his will. But thou, O Lord, be merciful to me, a fool. The room was hushed. In silence rose the king and sought his gardens cool and walked apart and murmured low, Be merciful to me, a fool. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. At Midsummer by Louise Chandler Moulton From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao At Midsummer the spacious noon enfolds me with its peace. The affluent midsummer wraps me round. So still the earth and air, that scarce a sound affronts the silence, and the swift caprice of one stray bird's lone call does but increase the sense of some compelling hush profound, some spell by which the whole vast world is bound till star-crowned night smile downward its release. I sit and dream, midway of the long day, midway of the glad year, midway of life. My whole world seems, indeed, to hold its breath. For me the sun stands still upon his way, the winds for one short hour remit their strife. Then day and year and life well on toward death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Sunrise Song by Sidney Lanier From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin A Sunrise Song Young Palmer sun, that to the shining sands Pourest thy pilgrim's tale, discoursing still Thy silver passages of sacred lands With news of sepulchre and Dolores Hill Canst thou be he that, yester sunset warm Purple with pain and rage and rack desire Dashed, ravening out of a dusty lair of storm, Harried the west, and set the world on fire. Hast thou perchance repented, Saracen's son? Wilt warm the world with peace and dove desire? Or wilt thou, ere this very day be done, Blaze Saladin still with unforgiving fire? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Illusions by Robert Underwood Johnson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Illusions Go, stand at night upon an ocean craft And watch the folds of its imperial train Catching in fleecy foam a thousand glows A miracle of fire unquenched by sea There in bewildering turbulence of change whirls the whole firmament till as you gaze all else unseen it is as heaven itself had lost its poise and each unanchored star in phantom haste flees to the horizon line what dupes we are of the deceiving eye how many a light man wanderingly acclaim is but the phosphor of the path life makes with its own motion while above forgot sweep on serene the old unenvious stars end of poem this recording is in the public domain proem from the isles of the amazons part three by joaquin miller from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Proem from The Isles of the Amazons, Part 3. Come, lovers, come, forget your pains. I know upon this earth a spot where clinking coins that clank as chains upon the souls of men are not, nor man is measured for his gains of gold that stream with crimson stains. There snow-topped towers crush the clouds and break the still abode of stars, like sudden ghosts in snowy shrouds, new broken through their earthly bars, and condors wet their crooked beaks on lofty limits of the peaks. O oh, men that fret as frets the main, You irk me with your eager gaze Down in the earth for fat increase, Eternal talks of gold and gain, Your shallow wit, your shallow ways, And breaks my soul across the shoal, As breakers break on shallow seas. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A California Christmas by Joaquin Miller From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama A California Christmas Behold where beauty walks with peace Behold where plenty pours her horn of fruits, of flowers, fat increase as generous as light of morn green shasta san diego seas of bloom and green between them rolled great herds in grasses to their knees and green earth garmented in gold white peaks that prop the sapphire blue look down on edens such as when that fair first spot perfection knew and god walked perfect earth with men i say god's kingdom is at hand right here if we but lift our eyes. I say there lies no line or land between this land and paradise. Joaquin Miller End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Yusuf by James Russell Lowell From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator. Craig Franklin as the stranger. And Thomas Peter as Yusuf. Yusuf. A stranger came one night to Yusuf's tent, saying, Behold, one outcast and in dread, Against whose life the bow of power is bent, Who flies and hath not where to lay his head. I come to thee for shelter and for food, to Yusuf, 
called through all our tribes the good. This tent is mine, said Yusuf, but no more than it is God's. Come in and be at peace. Freely shalt thou partake of all my store. Is I of his who buildeth over these, our tents his glorious roof of night and day, and at whose door none ever yet heard nay. So Yusuf entertained his guest that night, and, waking him ere day, said, Here is gold. My swiftest horse is saddled for thy flight. Depart before the prying day grow bold. As one lamp lights another, nor grows less, so nobleness enkindleth nobleness. That inward light the stranger's face made grand, which shines from all self-conquest, kneeling low, he bowed his forehead upon Yusuf's hand, sobbing. O oh, Sheikh, I cannot leave thee so. I will repay thee all this thou hast done unto that Ibrahim who slew thy son. Take thrice the gold, said Yusuf, for with thee into the desert, never to return. My one black thought shall ride away from me. Firstborn, for whom by day and night I yearn, Balanced and just are all of God's decrees. Thou art avenged, my firstborn. Sleep in peace. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Beauty by Edmund Spencer From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Beauty From An Hymn in Honor of Beauty So every spirit, as it is most pure, And hath in it the more of heavenly light, So it the fairer body doth procure, To habit in, and it more fairly dight, with cheerful grace and amiable sight. For the soul the body form doth take, for soul is form, and doth the body make. Therefore, whenever that thou dost behold a comely corpse, with beauty fair and hued, know this for certain, that the same doth hold a beauteous soul, with fair conditions thewed, fit to receive the seed of virtue strewed, for all that fair is, is by nature good. That is a sign to know the gentle blood. Yet oft it falls that many a gentle mind dwells in deformed tabernacle drowned, either by chance against the course of kind, or through unaptness in the substance found, which it assumed of some stubborn ground that will not yield unto her form's direction, but is performed with some foul imperfection. And oft it falls, ay me, the more to rue, that goodly beauty, albeit heavenly born, is foul abused, and that celestial hue, which doth the world with her delight adorn, made but the bait of sin and sinner's scorn. Whilst every one doth seek and sue to have it, but every one doth seek but to deprave it. Yet na the more is that fair beauty's blame, but theirs that do abuse it unto ill, nothing so good but that through guilty shame may be corrupt and rested unto will. Natheless the soul is fair and beauteous still, however flesh's fault it filthy make, for things immortal no corruption take. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Beauty Unadorned From Elegies Book 1 and 2 From the Latin of Propertius Translation of Goldwyn Smith From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Beauty unadorned. Dear girl, what boots it thus to dress thy hair, 
or flaunt in silken garments rich and rare, to reek of perfume from a foreign mart, and pass thyself for other than thou art. Thus nature's gift of beauty to deface, and rob thy own fair form of half its grace. Trust me, no skill can greater charms impart. Love is a naked boy and scorns all art. Bears not the sod unbidden blossoms rare? The untrained ivy, is it not most fair? Greenest the shrub on rocks untended grows, Brightest the rill in unhewn channels flows. The beach is with unpolished pebbles gay, And birds untutored trill the sweetest lay. Not thus the damsels of the golden age Were wont the hearts of heroes to engage. Their loveliness was to no jewels due, But to such tints as once Apelles drew. From vain coquettish arts they all were free, Content to charm with simple modesty. By thee despite to me will ne'er be done, The woman pleases well who pleases one. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fortune by Sophocles, translated from the Greek by Richard Garnett. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org, by Jason in Panama. Fortune Twixt good and ill my wavering fortune see swayed in capricious instability, most like the moon, whose ceaseless wax and wane cannot two nights the self-same form retain. Viewless at first, then a dim streak revealed, then slow augmenting to an argent shield, and when at length to fair perfection brought, diminishing and dwindling quite to naught. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Greatness by Alexander Pope from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by sonia greatness from an essay on man epistle four honour and shame from no condition rise act well your part there all the honour lies fortune in man has some small difference made one flaunts in rags one flutters in brocade the cobbler aproned and the parson gowned, the friar hooded and the monarch crowned. What differ more, you cry, than crown and cowl? I'll tell you, friend, a wise man and a fool. You'll find if once the monarch acts the monk, or cobbler-like the parson will be drunk, worth makes the man and want of it the fellow. The rest is all but leather or prunella stuck over with titles and hung round with strings that thou mayst be by kings or whores of kings boast the pure blood of an illustrious race in quiet flow from lucrece to lucrece but by your father's worth if yours you rate count me those only who were good and great go if your ancient but ignoble blood has crept through scoundrels ever since the flood go and pretend your family is young, nor own your fathers have been fools so long. What can a noble sots or slaves or cowards? Alas, not all the blood of all the Howards. Who wickedly is wise or madly brave is but the more a fool, the more a knave. Who noble ends by noble means obtains, or failing smiles in exile or in chains, like good aurelius let him reign or bleed like socrates that man is great indeed end of poem this recording is in the public domain perseverance from the italian of leonardo da vinci translation of william wetmore story from the world's best poetry Volume 6, 
Fancy and Sentiment, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Perseverance. In facile nature's fancies quickly grow, but such quick fancies have but little root. Soon the Narcissus flowers and dies, but slow the tree whose blossoms shall mature to fruit. Grace is a moment's happy feeling, power a life's slow growth, and we for many an hour must strain and toil and wait and weep if we, the perfect fruit of all we are, would see. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The One White Hair by Walter Savage Landor from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama as Landor and Lian Yao as the Lady. The One White Hair The wisest of the wise listen to pretty lies and love to hear them told. Doubt not that Solomon listened to many a one, some in his youth, and more when he grew old. I never sat among the choir of wisdom's song, but pretty lies loved I as much as any king, when youth was on the wing, and, must it then be told, when youth had quite gone by. Alas, and I have not the pleasant hour forgot when one pert lady said, Oh, Landor, I am quite bewildered with a fright. I see, sit quiet now, a white hair on your head. Another, more benign, drew out that hair of mine, and in her own dark hair pretended she had found that one, and twirled it round. Fair as she was, she never was so fair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Growing Grey by Austin Dobson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter Growing Grey On est l'âge de son coeur Et du tôt. A little more toward the light Mi miserum Here's one that's white and one that's turning. Adieu to song and salad days. My muse, let's go at once to Jay's and order mourning. We must reform our rhymes, my dear. Renounce the gay for the severe. Be grave, not witty. We have no more the right to find that Pierre's hair is neatly twined, that Chloe's pretty. Young loves for us a farce that's played, Light canzonette and serenade, No more may tempt us. Grey hairs but ill accord with dreams, From aught but sour didactic themes Our years exempt us. A la bonne heure, you fancy so? You think for one white streak We grow at once satiric? A fiddlestick! Each hair is a string to which our grey-beard muse shall sing a younger lyric. One heart still sound, shall cakes and ale grow rare to youth because we rail at schoolboy dishes? Perish the thought, tis ours to sing, though neither time nor tide can bring belief with wishes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Healthful Old Age, from As You Like It, Act 2, Scene 2, by William Shakespeare, from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org, by Jason in Panama. Healthful Old Age Let me be your servant, though I look old, yet am I strong and lusty, for in my youth I never did apply hot and rebellious liquors in my blood. 
nor did not with unabashful forehead woo the means of weakness and debility. Therefore my age is as a lusty winter, frosty, but kindly. Let me go with you. I'll do the service of a younger man in all your business and necessities. Shakespeare End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Quack Medicines by George Crabbe From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter as the narrator Lian Yao as the patient And Jason in Panama as the quack Quack Medicines from The Burrow But now our quacks are gamesters and they play with craft and skill to ruin and betray. With monstrous promise they delude the mind, and thrive on all that tortures humankind. Void of all honor, avaricious, rash, the daring tribe compound their boasted trash. Tincture or syrup, lotion, drop or pill, all tempt the sick to trust the lying bill. And twenty names of cobblers turned to squires Aid the bold language of these blushless liars. There are among them those who cannot read, And yet they'll buy a patent and succeed, Will dare to promise dying sufferers aid, For who, when dead, can threaten or upbraid? With cruel avarice still they recommend More draughts, more syrup to the journey's end. I feel it not. Then take it every hour. It makes me worse. Why, then it shows its power. I fear to die. Let not your spirit sink. You're always safe while you believe and drink. Troubled with something in your bile or blood, you think your doctor does you little good. And grown impatient, you require in haste the nervous cordial nor dislike the taste. It comforts, heals, and strengthens. Nay, you think it makes you better every time you drink. Who tipples brandy will some comfort feel. But will he to the medicine set his seal? No class escapes them. From the poor man's pay, the nostrum takes no trifling part away. See, those square patent bottles from the shop now decoration to the cupboard's top, And there a favorite hoard you'll find within, Companions meet, the julep and the gin. Observe what ills to nervous females flow, When the heart flutters and the pulse is low. If once induced these cordial sips to try, All feel the ease, and few the danger fly. For, while obtained, of drams they've all the force, And when denied, then drams are the resource. Who would not lend a sympathizing sigh To hear yon infant's pity-moving cry? Then the good nurse, who, had she borne a brain, Had sought the cause that made her babe complain, Has all her efforts, loving soul, Applied to set the cry, and not the cause aside. She gave her powerful sweet without remorse, The sleeping cordial. She had tried its force, repeating oft. The infant, freed from pain, rejected food, but took the dose again. Sinking to sleep, while she her joy expressed, That her dear charge could sweetly take his rest. Soon may she spare her cordial. Not a doubt remains, but quickly he will rest without. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Three Warnings by Hester Lynch Thrale From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator Sonia as death And Thomas Peter as Dodson The Three Warnings the tree of deepest root is found, 
least willing still to quit the ground. T'was therefore said by ancient sages that love of life increased with years, so much that in our latter stages, when pains grow sharp and sickness rages, the greatest love of life appears. This great affection to believe, which all confess but few perceive, if old assertions can't prevail, be pleased to hear a modern tale. When sports went round and all were gay on neighbour Dodson's wedding day, death called aside the jocund groom with him into another room, and, looking grave, You must, says he, quit your sweet bride and come with me. With you? And quit my Susan's side? With you? The hapless husband cried, Young as I am, tis monstrous hard. Besides, in truth, I'm not prepared. My thoughts on other matters go. This is my wedding day, you know. What more he urged, I have not heard. His reasons could not well be stronger, so death the poor delinquent spared and left to live a little longer. Yet calling up a serious look, his hourglass trembled while he spoke. Neighbour, he said, farewell. No more shall death disturb your mirthful hour. And further, to avoid all blame of cruelty upon my name, to give you time for preparation and fit you for your future station, three several warnings you shall have before you're summoned to the grave. Willing for once, I'll quit my prey and grant a kind reprieve in hopes you'll have no more to say but when i call again this way well pleased the world will leave to these conditions both consented and parted perfectly contented what next the hero of our tale befell how long he lived how wise how well how roundly he pursued his course and smoked his pipe and stroked his horse the willing muse shall tell he chaffered then he bought and sold nor once perceived his growing old nor thought of death as near his friends not false his wife no shrew many his gains his children few he passed his hours in peace but while he viewed his wealth increase while thus along life's dusty road the beaten track Content he trod, old time, whose haste no mortal spares, uncalled, unheeded, unawares, brought on his eightieth year. And now, one night, in musing mood, as all alone he sate, the unwelcome messenger of fate once more before him stood. Half killed with anger and surprise, so soon returned. Old Dodson cries. So soon do you call it? Death replies. Surely, my friend, you're but in jest. Since I was here before, tis six and thirty years at least, and you are now fourscore. So much the worse, the clown rejoined. To spare the aged would be kind. However, see your search be legal, and your authority is to regal, else you are come on a fool's errand with but a secretary's warrant. Beside, you promised me three warnings, which I have looked for nights and mornings. But for that loss of time and ease, I can recover damages. I know, cries Death, that at the best I seldom am a welcome guest, but don't be captious, friend, at least. I little thought you'd still be able to stump about your farm and stable. Your years have run to a great length. I wish you joy, though, of your strength. Hold, says the farmer. Not so fast. 
I have been lame these four years past. And no great wonder. Death replies. However, you still keep your eyes, and sure to see one's loves and friends, for legs and arms would make amends. Perhaps, says Dodson, so it might, but latterly I've lost my sight. Oh, this is a shocking tale, tis true, but still, there's comfort left for you, each strives your sadness to amuse, I warrant you hear all the news. There's none, cries he, and if there were, I'm grown so deaf I could not hear. Nay, then. The spectre stern rejoined, These are unjustifiable yearnings. If you are lame and deaf and blind, you've had your three sufficient warnings. So come along, no more we'll part. He said, and touched him with his dart, and now old Dodson turning pale, yields to his fate, so ends my tale. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Old Age and Death by Edmund Waller From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Old Age and Death From Verses Upon His Divine Poesy the seas are quiet when the winds give over, So calm are we when passions are no more, For then we know how vain it was to boast Of fleeting things too certain to be lost. Clouds of affection from our younger eyes Conceal that emptiness which age descries. The soul's dark cottage, battered and decayed, Let's in new light through chinks that time has made. Stronger by weakness wiser men become as they draw near to their eternal home. Leaving the old, both worlds at once they view that stand upon the threshold of the new. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Ruling Passion by Alexander Pope From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Sonia as the narrator Thomas Peter as Helluo Lian Yao as Narcissa Craig Franklin as the courtier and Cobham And Jason in Panama as Eucleo The Ruling Passion From Moral Essays, Epistle 1 Search thou the ruling passion, there alone the wild are constant and the cunning known, the fool consistent and the false sincere, priests, princes, women, no dissemblers here. In this the lust, in that the avarice, were means, not ends, ambition was the vice. In this one passion man can strength enjoy, as fits give vigour just when they destroy. Time, that on all things lays his lenient hand, yet tames not this, it sticks to our last sand. Consistent in our follies and our sins, here honest nature ends as she begins. Old politicians chew on wisdom past, and totter on in business to the last. As weak, as earnest, and as gravely out, as sober Lanesboro dancing in the gout. Behold a reverend sire, whom want of grace has made the father of a nameless race, shoved from the wall perhaps, or rudely pressed by his own son, that passes by unblessed. Still to his wench he crawls on knocking knees, and envies every sparrow that he sees. A salmon's belly, hello, was thy fate, the doctor called, declares all help too late. Mercy, cries hello, mercy on my soul, is there no hope? Alas, then bring the jowl. The frugal crone, 
whom praying priests attend, still tries to save the hallowed taper's end, collects her breath as ebbing life retires for one puff more, and in that puff expires. Odious, in woollen, twould a saint provoke, were the last words that poor Narcissa spoke. No, let a charming chintz and Brussels lace wrap my cold limbs and shade my lifeless face. One would not, sure, be frightful when one's dead. And, Betty, give this cheek a little red. The courtier smooth, who forty years had shined, an humble servant to all humankind, just brought out this, when scarce his tongue could stir. If, where I'm going, I could serve you, sir. I give and I devise. Old Euclid said and sighed. My lands and tenements to Ned. Your money, sir. My money, sir, what all? Why, if I must. Then wept. I give it Paul. The manor, sir. The manor hold, he cried. Not that, I cannot part with that. And died. And you, brave Cobham, to the latest breath, Shall feel your ruling passion strong in death, Such in those moments as in all the past. Oh, save my country, heaven! Shall be your last. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Will by Dr. John Donne From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Will Before I sigh my last gasp Let me breathe, great love, some legacies Here I bequeath mine eyes to Argus If mine eyes can see if they be blind, then, love, I give them thee. My tongue to fame, to ambassadors my ears, To women or the sea my tears. Thou, love, hast taught me heretofore By making me serve her who had twenty more, That I should give to none, but such as had too much before. My constancy I to the planets give, My truth to them who at the court do live, Mine ingenuity and openness to Jesuits, To buffoons my pensiveness, My silence to any who abroad have been, My money to a capuchin. Thou, love, taught'st me by appointing me to love there, Where no love received can be, only to give to such as have an incapacity. My faith I give to Roman Catholics, all my good works unto the schismatics of Amsterdam, my best civility and courtship to an university, my modesty I give to shoulders bare, my patience let gamesters share. Thou, love, taught'st me by making me love her, that holds my love disparity, Only to give to those that count my gifts in dignity. I give my reputation to those which were my friends, Mine industry to foes, To schoolmen I bequeath my doubtfulness, My sickness to physicians or excess, To nature all that I in rhyme have writ, And to my company my wit. Thou, love, by making me adore her, Who begot this love in me before, Taught'st me to make, as though I gave, When I do but restore. To him, for whom the passing bell next tolls, I give my physic books, My written rolls of moral counsels I to bedlam give, My brazen medals unto them which live in want of bread, to them which pass among all foreigners, mine English tongue. Thou, love, by making me love one who thinks her friendship a fit portion for younger lovers, dost my gifts thus disproportion. 
therefore I'll give no more, but I'll undo the world by dying, because love dies too. Then all your beauties will be no more worth than golden mines, where none doth draw it forth, and all your graces no more use shall have than a sundial in a grave. Thou, love, taught'st me by making me love her, who doth neglect both me and thee, to invent and practice this one way to annihilate all three. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Skeleton by Anonymous From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama To a Skeleton The manuscript of this poem which appeared in 1820 was said to have been found in the Museum of the Royal College of Surgeons in London near a perfect human skeleton. It was published in the Morning Chronicle. The author was never discovered, although a reward of fifty guineas was offered. Behold this ruin! T'was a skull once of ethereal spirit full. This narrow cell was life's retreat. This space was thought's mysterious seat. What beauteous visions filled the spot! What dreams of pleasure long forgot! Nor hope, nor joy, nor love, nor fear has left one trace of record here. Beneath this mouldering canopy once shone the bright and busy eye. But start not at the dismal void, if social love that eye employed, if with no lawless fire it gleamed, but through the dews of kindness beamed, that I shall be for ever bright when stars and sun are sunk in night. Within this hollow cavern hung the ready, swift, and tuneful tongue. If falsehood's honey it disdained, and when it could not praise was chained, if bold in virtue's cause it spoke, yet gentle concord never broke. This silent tongue shall plead for thee when time unveils eternity. Say, did these fingers delve the mine, or with the envied rubies shine? To hew the rock, or wear a gem, can little now avail to them. But if the page of truth they sought, or comfort to the mourner brought, these hands a richer meed shall claim than all that wait on wealth and fame. Avails it whether bare or shod these feet the paths of duty trod? If from the bowers of ease they fled, to seek affliction's humble shed, if grandeur's guilty bribe they spurned, and home to virtue's cot returned, these feet with angel wings shall vie, and tread the palace of the sky. Anonymous End of Poem This recording is in the public domain. The True Philosophy of Life by William Dunbar Modernized by Hugh Halliburton From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin The True Philosophy of Life Full oft I muse and he's in thought The passage of the speeding year And fortune with her changing cheer our ills on ilka hand confessed. We will not mourn for that, my dear, but to be blithe we'll count it best. Fast as this world fleets awa, as fast her wheel does fortune care. At no time tired or taking rest, what then? The limmers o'er us eh, and to be blithe I think it's best. Would pampered man consider weel, ere fortune on him turn her wheel? That earthly honour canna lest, his far less pain for he would feel, but to be blithe I think it best. Why would with this dour world strive? Will I his days in duller drive? And though he stood or lands possessed, he could na weel be said to live. 
he's only a thullin at the best. We are the treasury of the earth, what profit is there wanting mirth? We are the crops of east and west, without contentment there is death. So to be blithe is surely best. Let name for tinsel droop and dee, the thing is but a vanity. And to the life that I shall lest, here's out the twinkling of an e. So to be blithe, I think it best. Had I, because my lot is pure, tint heart and hope and harboured fear, and been with carried cares oppressed, I had been dead lang syne am sure, but to be blithe, I think it best. However fortune change and veer, let's blithely live and langs we're here, and yet be ready and addressed to pass content without a tear, believing a thing for the best. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1.